Uh, Spirit of the living God, we come before you in Jesus' name, Lord. And once again, we do thank you. Um, we want to be thankful and not just mouth the words of thank you. Um, we do praise you for your, your spirit, your salvation, your grace. Lord, as we get into your word, as always, we do ask for conviction. We ask for challenge. We ask for change. We ask to be um, encouraged by your grace and mercy to, to do what pleases you. And so, Lord, we ask uh, to just fill us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're in 1 Kings uh, chapter 20, verse 35 through 21, 29. Okay, so you guys remember um, in last week's episode, God was being really gracious to Ahab. Um, there was a, uh, Benadad, the, the king of Assyria, decided he wanted to attack Israel. And um, the Lord sent a prophet to Ahab and told him, go fight because I'm going to give you victory in the battle. And so there was the first battle. Israel won, and God sent the prophet back to tell Ahab, get ready, because next year, the devil will be back. And, you know, we looked at how, in a victory, you know, the devil shrinks back, but we can't get big-headed, big -headed because he only shrinks back for an opportune time to come back. And so they came back the next time, but this time God told Ahab, I want you to totally wipe out the Assyrians and kill the king. Well, there was a great victory on Ahab's part um, with just a few thousand people over hundreds of, hundreds of thousands that Assyria had. And when Benadad, the Syrian king, ran into the city to hide, he surrendered. And instead of executing executing him, Ahab said, oh, you're my brother. And sent him back home with a peace treaty. You guys remember all that? Okay. So that brings us to where we are now. Verse 35. Hello. Okay, so this is um, entitled Grace to the Humble. Now. 90-year-old Larry, he went to the, host, uh, to the doctor for a physical, and all of his tests came back normal. And the doctor said, Larry, everything looks great. How are you doing mentally and emotionally, and are you at peace with the Lord? Well, Larry replied, God and I are tight. He knows I have poor eyesight, so he's fixed it. When I get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom, poof, the light goes on. And when I'm done, poof, the light goes out. Wow, that's incredible, the doctor said. A little later on in the day, the doctor called Larry's wife. Said, hello, Miss Bonnie. How's Larry doing? He's doing fine. But I called you because I'm in awe of his relationship with God. Is it true when he gets up during the night, poof, the light goes on when he goes into the restroom. And when he's done, poof, the light goes out. And Bonnie replied, oh, sweet Jesus. He's peeing in the refrigerator again. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> so back to Ahab. All right. So where we are, it's not too long after the battle has taken place. And, um, you know, whatever happens after, after a war. Well, verse 35 says, Now, a certain man of the son of the prophets said to his neighbor, By the word of the Lord, 
strike me, please. And the man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, surely as soon as you depart from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he left him, a lion found him and killed him. Okay, so it says the sons of the prophets. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean children of prophets, but more like in order are the school of the prophets. Now, these were men and women because they were prophetess who are anointed with the gift and office of a prophet. But just because they had that gift, they also had to be trained and discipled as prophets. And so because they were the sons of the prophets, they kind of hung out together, right? Anyway, the prophets, they were easily recognizable um, from everybody else because everybody knew who they were. I don't know what, besides doing weird things, they stood out, right? So in our text, it says, this prophet goes to a man and says, by the word of the Lord, strike me. Well, the guy he, who he was talking to, um, he was a fellow prophet. It wasn't just somebody that he saw walking down the street. So he knew that this prophet was speaking by the word of the Lord. But for whatever reason, he refused to hit him. You know, now I don't know if he had like an internal conflict going on. Like he was thinking, you know, hitting people is wrong. Hitting God's prophets is really wrong. You know, you're crazy. I don't want to get in trouble like that with the Lord. So he refused. But then the prophet says to him, just because you didn't listen to God, you're going to get killed by a lion. And then he got eaten or killed by a lion. Right? You guys following that? Now, because of Daryl's brain, the way Daryl's brain works. <laughs> I'm thinking Charlie the prophet got ate by the lion. And everybody's talking about, did you hear what happened to Charlie? Yeah, I heard what happened to Charlie. He was told to do something and he didn't do it. Man. Dumb Charlie, right? This is just how my brain works. All right, so verse 37. Then he found another man and said, strike me, please. So the man struck him, inflicting a wound. All right, so he walked up to another dude and he's like, hit me. And the dude was like, say less. <laughs> and clocked him. He's like, I heard what happened to Charlie. Anyway. I got to say this for those of you who like to try to twist the word of God to your advantage. Okay. This works when somebody comes to you and says, the Lord said for you to hit me. <laughs> this does not work. When you say I'm about to blacken your eyes and bloody your nose because the Lord told me to. All right. So don't. Say, I'm laying holy hands on you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Verse 38. Then when the prophet departed, he waited for the king by the road and disguised himself with a bandage over his eyes. Now, as the king passed by, he cried out to the king and said, your servant went out into the midst of the battle. And there a man came over and brought a man to me and said, guard this man. And if by any means he is missing, your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. And while your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. So the king of Israel, that is King Ahab, said, Your judgment shall be. You yourself have decided it. Okay, so like I said, all of this seems to have taken place not too long after the battle. Ahab was probably on his way back home to to the capital city um and he had just sent ben Haddad home safely with a covenant of peace so this prophet who's now beat up swollen and bruised with his eyes bandaged he's waiting alongside the road for ahab to pass by 
So as the king is passing by, he, he's pleading his case to him so the king can intervene and pronounce judgment. Now, he told him his story and the reason that he gave for failing in his responsibilities to guard the prisoner was because he was busy here and there. In other words, he was saying, although I was given a command to do this thing, I found something else more personally beneficial to me at the time. So instead of fulfilling my obligations to the Lord, I have filled my life with distractions. Oh. Now, distractions in and of themselves are not sin. Mm. However, they are weights. And those weights can become sins because I have habitually placed my distractions above my responsibilities to the Lord. Oh, that's good. Hebrews 12, 1 states, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is before us. The sin that so easily ensnares us is the sin of disobedience. And of course, disobedience is rooted in pride, right? So every sin that we commit, its root is always in pride. God says, don't. I say, do. God says, do. I say, no. It's kind of like telling your kid to go wash the dishes and they're like, I ain't going to do it. Right? My kids used to be like, why do I got to wash dishes? Why do I got to feed you? I mean, we can eliminate you doing dishes. <laughs> anyway, so after pleading this case to the king, the king of Israel said to them, so shall your judgment be. You yourself have decided it. See, Ahab, he was wicked and he was without mercy. So basically what he did, he had just passed the death sentence upon this man because he knew he did not have a hundred pounds of silver to pay the debt that was required to spare his life. Verse 41. And so the prophet hastened to take the bandage away from his eyes and the king of Israel recognized him as one of the prophets. Then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. All right, so what the Lord was doing, he was using a prophet to tell a story about somebody else in order for Ahab to pronounce judgment upon himself. And it was the judgment for the very thing he was guilty of. It's the same way the Lord used Nathan, the prophet, to confront David when he sinned. Now, because this prophet was dressed like a soldier instead of a prophet with his face swollen, Ahab didn't recognize him. But when he took off the bandage, in my mind, Ahab's heart probably just dropped because God's prophets always got in his face and called him on the carpet for judgment. Now, Ahab's sin was the same as Saul's. Remember, the Lord had commanded Saul to utterly wipe out the Amalekites, but instead Saul decided to, to spare all the best stuff and keep everything. And, and then at least Saul lied and said, well, I was saving it for God, right? But Ahab... He wasn't even thinking about God. He just spared Benedad for his own reasons. <laughs> Ahab chose to reject God's command for what he felt was a better deal for himself. 
And like Saul and the prophet who wouldn't hit the other prophet, God told Ahab, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord and you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed for utter destruction, your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. Verse 43 says, so the king of Israel went to his house sullen and displeased and came to Samaria. OK, so when Ahab heard that God had pronounced this judgment against them, the scripture says that he became sullen and displeased. And that means he was in a gloomy and depressed mood and became angry and hot tempered. In other words, because it was God. All he could do was stamp his feet, scream, and run off home mad. You got it? It's like, you can't win. So, now keep that, that term, sullen and displeased, in your mind. Verse 20, uh, chapter 21. So it came to pass, after these things, that Naboth, the Jez Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near, next to my house. And for it I will give you another vineyard better than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. Okay, so... Ahab's main palace was in the city of Samaria, right? But his number two palace um, during the winter months was in Jezreel. Now, I've, I've never been to Israel, but from what I read and what I understand, Jezreel has like this beautiful view all across Israel. I guess you can kind of see everything, right? And in ancient times of war, um, kings stationed their place in Jezreel because the road south leading to the capital city of Samaria came through Jezreel. And so if you protected Jezreel, you protected Samaria. So basically you're protecting the whole kingdom by being in Jezreel. Is it making sense? Okay. So, um, Naboth, his family owned some property next to the king's palace in Jezreel. Now, remember, there had been a, a drought for three and a half years, and then God brought rain. And so now the land was fertile again, and um, Naboth's land was not only on a beautiful location, but it was rich and fertile. He had, he had a vineyard going, right? But Ahab wanted it for himself. Now, Ahab was the king. He already had everything he had 10 of the 12 tribes but he wanted this vineyard verse 3 says but Naboth said to Ahab the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers okay now Naboth was a man of God who truly honored the word of the Lord See, when Israel had conquered the land of Canaan, each tribe was given a portion of land, right? And then within each tribe, every family was allotted a portion of land. And it was supposed to belong to the family forever. You guys following that? Okay. Now, in hard times, the head of the family, he could sell their land or a portion of their land in order to get by. But every 50 years, there was a year of jubilee, and all property went back to the original owners of, or the original family of the owners of that land, right? It didn't matter how many improvements were made on it, um, it still was returned back to the family as its inheritance. Now, this, got, this, this is the way God was giving everybody a fresh start and a clean slate every 50 years. But the Lord was also stating to his people, the land is mine and you are stewards managing it. So take care of your assigned portions. Now, he never said that nobody would go broke. 
But if you did go broke, you could sell your land and it would come back every 50 years, right? So if you got broke in year 49, <laughs> right? You could sell your land, but it's, it's coming back next year, right? But if you got broke in year one, the land's worth a whole lot more because now this family has 49 years to do stuff with it, right? So you probably want to try to not go broke to year 49. Then you could sell it for a few dollars and then it's coming back, right? Or, you know, you could probably be slick, but then God would get you and figure like, well, there's 49 years, I'll sell it. They'll build a whole bunch of stuff on it and then we'll get it back. But you weren't supposed to do that. It was only legitimately hard times. In Leviticus uh, 25, 23, the Lord said, The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, and you are strangers and so sojourners or pilgrims with me. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possessions, and if his redeeming relatives comes to redeem it, then he may redeem what his brother sold. But if he is not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his possession. So God set up a system in Israel where nobody would be just wiped out. Now, in Naboth's case, his family hadn't fallen on hard times. They were doing well. So to sell his property, his property for profit or just trade it for something else because the king wanted to do that would be a sin and in violation of his family's God-given blessing. In Ezekiel 46, 16, the scripture says, Thus says the Lord, If the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance to any of his sons, it shall belong to his sons. It is their possession by inheritance. But if he gives a gift to some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his servants until the year of liberty. After that, it shall return to the prince, but his inheritance shall be to his sons and shall become theirs. But then it says, Moreover, the prince or the king shall not take any of the people's inheritance by evicting them from their property. He shall provide inheritance for his sons from his own property so that none of my people may be scattered from his property. So God said, listen, I'm the one who gave each of you your allotted portion of land and you cannot use your power, your influence, to kick somebody else out and take it, right? And if you are a king and you want to bless one of your servants, that's cool, but in the year of Jubilee, it comes back to your family. So no matter what, it stays the way I said. Does it make sense? So this is where Naboth was. He was like, listen, God gave this to my family. It's been handed down, and I'm not giving it to you. <laughs> Naboth was like Joseph when the opportunity to sin came, and he was like, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The Lord forbid that I should do this wickedness and give you the inheritance of my fathers to you. So verse four. So Ahab went to his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, has spoken to him. For he has said... I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And Ahab lay down on his bed and turned his face away and would eat no food. But Jezebel, his wife, came in to him and said, 
why is your spirit sullen? And why that you eat no food? All right, so there's this movie <laughs> called Fridays. Now, there's this scene where the neighborhood bully, his name is Debo, he comes and he takes this guy's necklace from him, right? And then the guy screams, my grandmama gave me that necklace. Okay. But now, I'm not talking about kids. These are like grown men. Now, because he's a grown man and he's hanging on a porch with his other grown man friends, he don't want anybody to see him crying. So he jumps off the porch and runs to his car like this. Right? And now there's another character. His name is Smokey. Smokey says he's going to cry when he get in the car. Right? And that's what Naboth did. He ran off, jumped in his little chariot and cried, got on the bed, turned his face to the wall. He wouldn't drink his juice or eat his snacks. <laughs> he just lay there whimpering and holding his breath till he turned blue. Now, Ahab was a weak man in a powerful position. But he was also a spoiled brat. He was used to getting what he wanted, when he wanted. But when things didn't go his way or when he was challenged with opposition, he would just cower and crumble. But there was much more to what's going on here than him simply being weak and having a fit because he couldn't get it, get his way. See, this was a spiritual conflict. Ahab knew he was being shut down once again by God. See, he was an Israelite. Ahab was like a church kid who grew up in a Christian home, but never personally accepted the Lord as a savior. Culturally, Ahab knew what it meant to be an Israelite. Just like that church kid that, know, that knows what Christian culture is and knows how Christians think and what Christians believe. Ahab knew from his heart that Naboth was standing on the law and word of God. So Ahab knew that his refusal of his offer wasn't simply an excuse. It was from a heart that was genuinely in love with the Lord. See, for both Naboth and Ahab, as children of Israel, the law of God is their identity. Ahab just chose to worship different gods, giving him an imposter's identity. But nothing he did spiritually could cause him to escape being one of God's chosen people naturally and what I mean by that is the Jews Israel they are God's chosen people by birth naturally that doesn't mean that they're saved it just means that they're his chosen nation to represent him to the rest of the world now whether they believe in God or not doesn't change the fact that this is who you are that's why the Jews, no matter where they've been, no matter how long they've been out of their country, they stay Jews. Every country that's conquered them throughout history always had a problem with the Jews. They couldn't make them stop being Jews. <laughs> no matter where they are. I mean, from, from the North Pole to the South Pole, whatever country they are in, they stay Jews. It's their God-given identity. Now, it doesn't mean that they're saved. It just means that they're God's chosen people. And some people say, you know, one of some of the dumbest things I hear is like, oh, the Jews control the media. Okay, well, if that's the case, how come the media never says anything good about them? In 
in countries where there are no Jews, those countries are doing bad. God said, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. The United States has the second largest population of Jews besides Israel. Now, today, most Jews are atheists, are secular heathens. Yet, because of their God-given identity as his people, culturally, they still celebrate all the Jewish holidays, eat kosher food, follow Jewish customs, fight for the land of Israel, all while denying the God that called them and gave them the land. It, they don't even believe in God. And you're like, well, why are you fighting for this land? God gave it to us. You don't believe in God. <laughs> it's confusing. So Ahab knew this was the word of God and there was no way around it. So he had another temper tantrum and ran home. Now, remember that phrase, Ahab was sullen and displeased? Ahab had a big problem. He took issue with the Lord being God. He was totally fine with the Lord being his savior and getting him out of jams or orchestrating things the way he wanted them. But when it came to the Lord being God, whose word never changes, whose judgment stands and whose commands we must follow, that displeased Ahab. It angered him and depressed him. The world cannot stand faithful Bible-believing Christians because the Spirit and the Word of God stands in their way, keeping them from doing all that they want to do. I mean, the world is cool with Christians that look like them. So what does the world do? It uses corrupt leaders and politics to get around, over, and remove God. See, God gave his word, and man gave politics. God's word says this, so politically we'll make laws and regulations that say that. The word of God shines light on the truth, exposing their lies and their darkness. And the spirit restrains their plans and frustrates their efforts. Mm. And it's for these reasons that the world has Jesus derangement syndrome. <laughs> Did you come up with that? <laughs> like Trump derangement. <laughs> and as true Bible-believing Christians with the Holy Spirit living within us, we represent Jesus. Therefore, the world hates us because it hated him first and they hate him more. But they can't hit him. So they hit his representatives. Anyway, so once again, Abraham, uh, Abraham, Ahab, He's mad. He got Jesus derangement syndrome. He's been thrown into a tizzy. He's so and displeased because the Lord was standing in his way once again. <laughs> so he's on the bed, pouting, not eating his snacks, drinking his juice. And the servants went and told Jezebel, the king won't eat. And she comes in and is like, what is it now? Why are you crying? Verse 6, and he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and I said, give me your vineyard for money, or else if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. <laughs> Proverbs 27.20 says, just as hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man 
are never satisfied. Ahab was king over 10 out of 12 tribes. He was rich. He had multiple palaces. He had property all over the country. Yet none of that was enough for him. He wanted this one particular piece of property. And because he was told no, based upon righteous principles, he had a meltdown. Now, Check this out. Naboth said that he could not give his family's God-given inheritance up. His value was based in the Lord. But to Ahab, it was nothing more than the vineyard. He has such little respect for the Lord that he didn't say Naboth won't part with his family's inheritance from God. He said Naboth won't give me his vineyard. That's, to him, it was just a vineyard. It had nothing to do with the Lord's given law as your family's inheritance. Now, when we do not view all that the Lord has blessed us with, we'll downgrade his blessings, our people in our lives, to nothing but another vineyard. Right? God, you unemployed, broke, Lord, give me a job. He gives you a job. You're there a month and a half. I hate this stupid job. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, Lord. <clears throat> Please, I want to marry this man. Pastor, will you marry us? Okay. Nobody ever asked the pastor, should I marry them? <laughs> they just want you to do it. And then when it doesn't work, they want to know, how can I get out of this pastor? <laughs> Maybe your singleness was the blessing. <laughs> Just for a little bit. Because, you know, it's like, here's my choice and here's God's choice. Okay. The problem that we've had our whole life is going with my choice. What I like. So Naboth is upset because he can't get the vineyard which is really the Lord's possession, inheritance, but all he sees is a vineyard. Verse 7 says, Then Jezebel, his wife, said to him, You now exercise authority over all Israel. Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. And she wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, sent letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth, and she wrote in a letter saying, Proclaim a fast. Seat Naboth with high honor among the people. And seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness, saying of him, saying against him, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. Okay, so Jezebel was like, Why are you crying? Yeah, I can't have a vineyard back to bed. And she's like, Uh uh, baby. You're the king of Israel. You can do whatever you want. You want the stupid vineyard? I'll give it to you. So get up and eat and be happy. Now, I remember reading this story to my boys when they were growing up. And I'm trying to be serious because we're having Bible study time. And I read the story and they fell out on the floor. I mean, they were just dying. He turned his face to the wall like a little brat. <laughs> I was like, it wasn't even supposed to be funny. <laughs> now, Naboth said that he couldn't give up his family's God-given inheritance. But for 
Ahab and Jezebel, it was nothing but a vineyard. Now, Jezebel, she may have been a citizen of Israel. She was his queen, but she was not an Israelite at heart. See, the Bible was Israel's constitution, and the Lord was their true king. But she despised the Lord and rejected God's laws, except where she could use them as a weapon for her own advantage. So she wrote letters in the king's name to the rulers of Jezreel and sealed them with Ahab's seal. Now, according to the customs and laws of God for Israel, um, she laid out her instructions according to the laws and customs of God. First, she told all the leading politicians to proclaim a fast. Now, in Israel, the proclamation of a fast meant there was some tragedy in the land or in the city, and the people needed to mourn and repent. And then they needed to deal with whatever God had displeasure in. <clears throat> so for us, it would kind of be like um, flying the flags at half staff, at half staff or, or taking a moment of silence for something, right? Anyway, to announce this fast, it meant that they had to gather everybody in the city in an official assembly. You guys kind of getting this? Yeah. Now, all the bigwigs of the city are there. And then they seat Naboth in the highest seat of honor. Okay, so try to, I'm going to try to give you a picture. Um, try to understand what's taking place. Imagine a citywide emergency, right? And a citywide emergency meeting has been called. And when you get there, the mayors, the judges, the, whoever the people are, those kind of people, right? All the high officials are there sitting at the table. And then they call you up front to sit at the table with them to make this announcement, right? Now, everybody knows there's an emergency. But you're sitting there wondering, why am I up here with these guys? Right? Am I about to get a, 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 a promotion? Right? It's like, why am I here? And this emergency. What, what's going on with this emergency? How am I supposed to be a help in this emergency? And then your wife and your kids are there. And they're like, oh, look. Dad is up there with the mayor. And the chief of police and the DA and, oh, wow. And then according to the law, they bring out two dudes as witnesses to give testimony. Wow. Now, you may know who they are, but they're not the kind of people that you deal with. And so you're sitting there looking at these dudes like, I wonder what these thugs have to say. Now, in Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight, 28, the law commands this. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. Both of those charges are capital offense, um, capital offense charges, right? So then these two thugs get on the stand and straight out lie on you and say you have blasphemed God and the king. Wow. In Deuteronomy 17, 6, it says, Whoever is deserving of death shall not be put to death on the test shall shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. The hands of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death. And afterward, the hands of all the people, so you shall put away the evil from among you. So, in Israel, one person couldn't testify against you to get the death penalty. Two or three 
could. And since they're the ones who brought the testimony, they had to throw the first rocks, right? And then the city joins in. Okay. So let's say you didn't see what happened, but the testimony has been given. The death penalty has been pronounced. The people who brought the testimony, they throw the first rocks, but you got to pick up your rocks and jump in. Does that make some sense? But you're doing it because you're following the law. Is, is that making sense? Okay. So verse 11. So the men of the city, the elders and the nobles who were in and the ha, who were inhabitants of the city did as Jezebel sent to them, as it was written in the letters which she has sent to them. And they proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth with high honor among the people. And the two men, scoundrels, came in before him. And the scoundrels witnessed against him, against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. Okay, so let me check this out. In the world, there are three types of people. There's the deceived, the deceivers, and the upright. The upright are people who have no agenda. We live by truth according to what is good and stand on the truth and fight for what's right. The deceivers, they have an agenda. They know the truth, but they have no integrity and they cannot stand the truth. The deceivers will start a lie or they know that something is a lie. But because they benefit from the lie, they'll promote it as the truth no matter who it destroys. And then there's the deceived. The deceived are innocent people who believe the deceiver's lies. And because they believe the lie, they fight for the lie. The deceived people think they are fighting for a good thing. But the deceived people, their innocence and their passion to do what they believe is good is used by the deceivers in order to accomplish their agenda. The big problem with the deceived is that they're easy to fool, but it's nearly impossible to convince them that they've been fooled. So Jezebel, the deceiver, used the leaders and rulers and two worthless scoundrels who were also deceivers to accomplish her agenda. Her agenda was to legally get rid of Naboth and gain possession of his property for Ahab. But in order to do that, she had to execute him. But not only him, she had to execute all of his sons so that there would be no heirs to the property. And 2 Kings 9, 6, it says they stoned Naboth and all of his male descendants. Now, the people of the city, because they believe the lies that their leaders told them, and they thought they were doing right, all of these innocent people, as far as the lie went, were the ones used to execute Naboth and all of his kids. In other words, Jezebel weaponized Congress, Senate, the Justice Department, the media, and got a mob of people to burn down cities against an innocent man who obeyed the law and did what was right because he truly loved the Lord. Wow. 
So it came to pass when Hillary heard, I mean, Je Jezebel heard that <laughs> Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money. For Naboth is not alive, but dead. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab got up and went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. He just got up and ran outside happy to go play with his new toy. And it didn't matter how he got it as long as he got it. Right? Some people don't mind if the referee cheats for their side. It's not that they hate cheating. They just hate being cheated. Verse 17 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth, the dogs shall lick your blood, even yours. Okay, so Ahab, he's been doing his thing. He's been winning his little battles and victories. He got in trouble for not killing Benadad. Then he came up with, well, he didn't come up with it. Jezebel came up with this plan that he basically okayed and got Naboth's vineyard. In the meantime, Elijah has been chilling with Elisha, training him, bringing him up. And then God speaks to him again. is like, go talk to Ahab. You tell him, you done this. And now you're going to die. And just like you saw the dogs licking Naboth's blood, they're going to lick yours. So Ahab, he looks at Elijah and says, have you found me, oh, my enemy? <laughs> and Elijah answered and said, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord says, behold, I will bring calamity on you. I will take away your posterity and I will cut off from Ahab every male in Israel, both bond and free. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and the house of ba Baasha, the son of Ahijah, because of the provocation which you have provoked me to anger, to anger me and make Israel to sin. Now, check this out. God didn't come for Jezebel. He came from Ahab. When Adam messed up, God didn't come for Eve. He came for Adam. When David got into his thing with Bathsheba, he didn't come for Bathsheba. He came for David. As men, God has given men the responsibility to be the head. The covering and the position of what's right. We're to be the protectors of society. But when men aren't being men, women step out of their place. And step into the wrong place. But they can't step into the wrong place. Before men. Stepping out of their place. So when a man doesn't want to be a man. A woman. Is out of order. In a man's position. Alright. So now before you guys start stoning me. <laughs> I'm just trying to. Trying to make, make this clear. Men and women are equal with different roles, different positions, right? With different powers. 
a woman's power is influence. Influence, you can't see it. You can't necessarily nail it down. But it can get in there and just move things, right? A man's power is his position. A position, you can see it. You know exactly where it's at. It's either I'm going to deal with it or I'm not. It's the position that keeps the influence in check. Okay? Christ is the husband, the head of the church. Right? When he left his word, he didn't leave it in the hands of a man. He left it in the hands of his bride to influence the world. Oh, that's so good. But as the head, he keeps that bride in check. That's good. Does that make sense? That's good. Absolutely. Now, could you imagine if Jesus was like, okay, I don't feel like doing all those responsible things as the husband of the church. <laughs> Go ahead, take my power and influence the world. It just would be all bad. Does that make sense? So when society is messed up, God is coming for the men first. I mean, I always say I think it's easier to be the woman because it don't fall on you. I mean, you got your own responsibility in the end. Everybody does individually. But when there's trouble in the home, God comes for the head. So God comes for Ahab. He's letting them know. You remember what happened to Jeroboam? How his whole family got wiped out? And then how your father wiped out Baasha? And his whole family got wiped out. Remember how his descendants were trying to escape in the city and got chased down in the fields and then the dogs ate them? Well, that's what's about to happen to you. Then he says, and concerning Jezebel, she didn't get away. The Lord also spoke saying, the dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. The dogs shall eat whoever belongs to Ahab and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the field. Now, Ahab was a Jew, an Israelite. He knew the history of his people. His family came into ruling the throne because of that exact same judgment on the king that was before his dad. And he got there because of the judgment that was on the king before him. So this was like, you've seen this movie before, Ahab, right? Now you are the star of it. And it says, verse 25, But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because of Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. And he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Okay, so if you read you read Leviticus 18, I mean, just take your time to read it. You want to know, well, God, why did you send Israel in there to just wipe out everybody in the land that you gave them? Read Leviticus 18. And then you'll be like, okay. God told Israel, they did all of these things. And because of that, I'm kicking them out. I'm not kicking them out because you're so good. I'm kicking them out because they're so bad. And I'm going to give you the land. But if you act like them, I'm going to kick you out too. The only difference between you and them is this. When I kick you out, you're going to still be my people. And wherever you go, people are going to hate you. 
And so wherever the Jews have been in any nation, with the exception of the United States, they've been hated. So verse 27 says, so it was when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his body, fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, see how Ahab has humbled himself before me because he has humbled himself before me. I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his house. Wow. Wow. Mercy. As wicked as Ahab was, I mean, it says there was no one like Ahab who sold himself in the sight of the Lord to do wickedness. Wow. But even in that, when he humbled himself before God, God gave him mercy. And it doesn't say that he turned and believed in God because he didn't. He didn't repent. He didn't get saved, but he humbled himself before God. For Ahab and Jezebel, they were doing whatever they wanted to do and thinking that it was cool, even using God's word to do it. But in Psalms 50, verse 16 it says, but to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or take my covenant in your mouth, saying you hate instruction and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil and frame and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother and slander your mother's son. These things you have done. And I kept silent. So you thought that I was altogether like you. But I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. God says, you were doing all this stuff. You were using my word to do it. You were claiming to be a believer and pushing abortion. You use my name. Want to take a knee and pray when it benefits you? And you think because you're getting away with it, I'm just like you? But when I lay the hammer, I'm going to lay all my charges out right before you. So Ahab, he humbles himself before God. Now, for us, because we're evil sinners... We love mercy when I get it. But boy, I don't want to give it to you. But the Lord's mercies are beyond comprehension. He'll turn away his wrath and pour out mercy on anyone who humbles himself, even unbelievers. In Jeremiah 18, 7, the Lord says, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck it up, to pull down and destroy it. If that nation of whom I have spoken against turns from its evil, then I will relent from the disaster I thought to bring upon it. God will do that for entire nations. How much more so for a single individual? What this does is shows the character of God's mercy and love that is given to the undeserving. Those who are innocent don't deserve mercy any more than those who are guilty. It's God's grace. Ahab, as great a sinner as he was, he won the mercy of God, even though he didn't repent from the heart. The worst sinner should not disqualify himself from God's mercy. I've heard people say, I can't go to God because of all that I've done. Well, God knew you were going to do it before you were born. And still came, became a man 
to save you. Ahab received mercy because he humbled himself. Even though he didn't repent. But his unbelief eventually led to his death. 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says, Now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that your, I do not rejoice that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. What that's saying is this. When you finally realize it's wrong and you're sorry because it's wrong and turn to God, that leads to salvation. Right. Not I'm sorry because I got caught. Right? In my former life, You be standing before the judge, pleading innocent. I'm not taking nothing. Then they say, well, okay, you can take it to trial and get 10 years. Or you can plead guilty and get time served. How do you want to plead? Guilty, your honor. I'm sorry. Not that I'm sorry it was wrong. I'm sorry for the consequences. And as soon as you let me go, I'm going to go do it again. Well, that kind of sorrow leads to death. But godly sorrow leads to repentance. And that's what God is looking at. He's looking at the heart. But he'll take, he'll take the, the, the outward breaking down in humility because hopefully that little bit of time You'll see it as kindness and turn all the way. Mercy, grace, and forgiveness is the heart and nature and character of God. And his spirit lives within us. Therefore, if the God of love pours out mercy and kindness upon unsaved sinners, which we all were, we should allow him to do the same through us right God says forgive your enemies bless those pray for them not destroy them not retaliate in Luke 6 35 it says but love your enemies do good lend hoping for nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the unthankful and the evil. God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful just as your father is also merciful. The Lord doesn't give us that command without giving us his spirit to carry it out. So when we say, I ain't there yet, basically what we're saying is, I ain't doing it. You are there. That's why God brought it into your life. In Proverbs, it says, Surely the Lord scorns the scornful, but he gives grace to the humble. Amen? Lord, we thank you that you give grace to the humble. The humble believers and the humble unbelievers. But Lord, it's your kindness and your mercy that leads us to repentance. And so, Lord, we want to have the same heart of love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness that you pour out upon us. And Lord, we want to be encouraged to see that even a person like Ahab can receive your mercy. How much more so? one of your children who stumbles to just come back to you, cry out, Abba, Father, and receive your grace, receive your mercy. 
receive your love and then turn around and be a strength and a comfort by which we receive comfort in order to comfort others. To be an encouragement because you are merciful and you are gracious. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, and we glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Our prayer partners are in the back. If you want prayer, uh, just look for the people with the badges on, and you can receive prayer.